This is the 17th year for the Art Harvest Studio Tour of Yamhill County. The tour, which is the first two weekends in October, is a great opportunity to talk to artists. Visiting an artist's studio can be a fascinating experience. We visited with Claire Carver, a painter in the Gaston area who farms with horses. Her farm is down a country lane and her studio is a historic farmhouse. So 2009 was my first year on the tour and it was fabulous. I didn't know what to expect. I was like, oh gosh, you know, who's going to come all the way out here to the middle of nowhere? And people really came and a lot of people came from Portland. People were just really excited to, to see the space. People enjoyed seeing the house. I did open studios um, in the Napa Valley and I did open studios in San Francisco. I found here people very much did come for the destination as well as the art um, and I hadn't experienced that in the past where in the past people came to my studio primarily for the art because I lived in town both in Napa and in San Francisco and it was just another house like anybody else's house and that happened to be where my studio was. So this is fun because it's a little more dynamic and people are like, oh, you know, interested in the space and I enjoy sharing that because we work really hard on this farm and it's all part of my life. You can't, you, you can't pull the two apart. You can't take the art, creating the art away from the fact that I'm farming, the fact that I'm farming with horses. I mean, I haven't done any paintings yet of the horses, but I'm sure they're coming. And so um, I, I think people really enjoy that. And I enjoy sharing that when people came out to this particular um, art harvest. Yeah, it's really inspiring to live here. I mean, obviously I have a hundred chickens and so they're around all the time and I love painting them because they're just, Every time they move, they make a new little drawing, and they're so expressive and doing things. And you can paint a chicken in almost any way, and it, it still looks very chickeny. <laughs> they're just, they're a lot of fun to paint. I think uh, people have found the chicken paintings really appealing because there's a lot of new chicken owners out there. So while this chicken might be a white chicken, there's very little white in this painting. This is probably the only bits of white that are in the painting at all, yet this chicken, you can tell, is white. And there's all this great color in her shadow, these really hot blues, quite a bit of yellow in here and orange, and that's an example of the color that you're observing as opposed to the color that the thing is. And that's, um, it's a pretty easy trap to fall into where it's a green truck so I'm gonna paint it green. The only time that you see that color green is where the sunlight is directly hitting that object. Then you have everything that's in shadow or where the sun's hitting it and it changes the color into something very hot. So doing that type of observation um, is something that I really honed in painting plein air and it transfers when you're not, like these paintings are not plein air. I go out and I take pictures and do sketches of the chickens and then I come back into the studio and do these paintings because chickens move way too fast to paint them plein air. Um, but that same practice translates really readily um, into the studio. So it, they're just quick paintings and really it's just a way to, uh, to practice. It's like practicing an instrument. I, I, I look at still lives that way. It's just a way to sort of observe, create compositions, and keep your chops up so that when you go out in the spring, you're ready to hit the ground running. I did go to art school. Um, I actually went to several art schools. <laughs> I, I was very lucky in that um, my father was an artist, and he, uh, pr professionally, he was an industrial designer. Um, but he recognized that I could draw. So he gave me private art lessons from a very young age and I continued those through high school and then I did go to art school for college. But I actually focused in graphic design. I didn't focus in painting because I probably in following my father it was like well I have to have a career because you can't make a living as an artist which is crazy. You, you totally can. Um, although I still do practice graphic design as well as my painting. I design wine labels which is is really a lot of fun and I, I don't really want to give it up because I frequently do create fine art for the labels that I that I do. Even we have our own wine brand and I've drawn all the labels for ours and each year I do a new 
label design for our vintages, which is a lot of fun. I actually have quite a few um, pre-made colors on my palette. I do mix a lot of my own color as well. For people starting out for painting, I recommend just starting with a, uh, a really basic palette. Um, but once you sort of really start to know your colors and know sort of what you're after, um, it just, <laughs> quite frankly, takes some of the work out of it. There's just a few colors that I like. There's some of these, these beautiful blues that I like in my shadows. This is called a King's Blue. And it's, um, it's, it's a pretty easy blue. It's just cobalt and white, essentially. But when you have it right out of the tube like that, it just makes it so that I can put it down and not really worry about it. I have it right there accessible to me. A lot of my paintings are small because when you're painting plein air, if you have a painting this big, the wind's going to take it away. And you're not going to finish. Because really, with a true plein air painting, Unless you plan on going back to the same spot the next day and the weather's going to change, forget it. I mean, for me at least, it's a one sitting painting. Um, and after two to three hours, depending on the time of year, the light's going to change. And everything in your painting just changed. I mean, going back to talking about this chicken, the sunlight's over here. As soon as the sun's here, which happens in about two hours, that blue shadow isn't even there anymore. So the whole painting changes, and that's you know very applicable in a landscape. So I paint typically from you know 12 inches up to about 14 inches for a plein air landscape because that's all I can get done in that period of time. Um, I typically paint on these masonite panels, which I just I gesso them and then I prime them in this red color, and. Um, the red's fairly unusual. A lot of artists do prime in a color, but it's usually a neutral. It's like a gray or sometimes a warmish pink color. I just happen to love high key color and the bright red sort of pumps up the whole palette when I'm working. You, you'll notice in my work, it's all pretty high key, very bright. And the, the red tends to start that process off in a hurry, when, especially when you're painting plein air. Um, so I do, I do paint some larger pieces in my studio um, and they're typically on canvas um, like this painting here that's on canvas as soon as you sort of get beyond a certain size the board isn't as stable and um, I typically don't cut a board bigger than you know 16 inches because then things could start to happen to the board unless you plan on mounting it in a particular way and also the way that you're working with a brush on a board has a certain feel to it and it, it gives itself to a certain size brush stroke. This is sort of hard to explain, but once you move to a canvas, you're using a bigger brush. The brush tends to, the canvas has more give. So it's, it's almost like a whole different style of painting um, in terms of the brush stroke. You can kind of see it in this painting. So in the larger painting, I mean, even in this, in this large background, you can see these big strokes that have a lot of movement to them. And that's because this canvas moves when I push on it with the brush. So I get this big active stroke with the, with the brush, with these large pieces here. While in this background here, they're, they're actually more sort of hash mark strokes that don't quite, ha they're just different. Um, they're a little tighter, they're a little, it's a smaller brush, they just have a different feel. A really good example of that um, is actually the painting that's in the other room. It's a large, more abstract painting of a haywell that has some really big, sort of watery brush strokes in it that you get with canvas. I think seeing, seeing your art as a business, um, one of the, the sort of entry points of that is taking yourself seriously. Always paint, always work on your art, but if you need to do other things to support your art, do those things, but just always come back to your art. Always know that your art is what you're supposed to be doing and what these other things are, are feeding into. Next, we visited Dwight Ewald in Carleton. Dwight studied art in Chicago, New York, and Italy. He's a sculptor and a painter. I like to watch what happens when the, when the things that are 
have patterns and are in orderly, and the things that are random come together. I started, started messing around with, with plastic pipes because I, I wanted to find a material that didn't have uh, a lot of references to it, a lot of, in art. You know, there was not a lot of, uh, kind of baggage with it. So some of the sculptures are actually that I make uh, are like things of wire or um, that are just really simple shapes, but they're, also, but they're also meant to have that sort of organicness that nature has as well. I like the way that the uh, Raku works with a lot of things because it's, uh, it's so organic and so uh, out of control to a certain extent. Uh, and it works really well with these really highly figured pieces of wood, which these are. When I'm, when I'm working with the materials that just kind of hold, like, hold themselves together that need to be carved, so this is a subtractive process, but I'm really thinking in terms of those uh, ideas of modernism and also of my other ideas of uh, the interrelationship of randomness and order. So, um, depending on the shape of the wood, you know, uh, or the shape of the stone, that's going to help you determine what you're going to make. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, deliberateness in what in art. It's happening on purpose. It's happening because you wanted it to. And it's kind of what I do when I approach wood carving is I look at the piece of wood and think, um, you know, how can this work for me to do what I want it to do? These are all some of these pieces of wood that are shaped like this are from um, what I think used to be. Rifle stock blanks. Sometimes uh, ideas of from culture come into what you're doing too. These came about just by uh, working with some pinch pots and just deciding, well, I want to do this kind of random globular thing. I was thinking that'd be kind of cool. But they also have this kind of look to them like uh, um, they could be uh, almost like polyps of some kind or even they even vaguely remind people of a figure and a particular figure uh, that if you took art history class, uh, there's this Venus of Willendorf figure, okay? And it, so it has that reference. So any sculpture that's about the size of a person makes you think of a person and you relate it to your own size and your own physicality. And, uh, that's part of the way that uh, you get content into artwork is by recognizing that if it looks like a figure, it's going to make those references and you have to deal with those references. So a lot of times I'll be using uh, patterns in a really kind of expressionistic way or, or paint in a really expressionistic way. Uh, just That thing just evolved, you know, it evolved out of a, a grid that was underneath and then just by keeping painting and painting and painting and letting certain um, references come in that I saw, you know, sometimes it looks, something looks like a plant, sometimes something looks like, uh, you know, circulatory system or sometimes something looks like you know the sky or whatever those things sort of come into the paintings and then there's also there are also a group of paintings that uh, I really allow random things to happen and, I'm, and I'm, I kind of let things happen like the, a painting like this one it's not so much uh, poured on as it is uh, set out you know and then tipped every now and then to let the paint move around in this case, uh, this is just set outside to let the needles fall onto it and stick. This is just something I just did yeah, the other day, and uh, I'm not sure if it's done yet. That's called a solar painting. Actually, it's uh, a photosensitive emulsion on the canvas, and then it's set out in the sun with objects over it, and then washed out. So the, so the imprint is actually of things that were placed on the surface of the canvas and so it creates those effects. Uh, I have some ideas about what, what things could mean, but it's not necessarily what they have to mean. Um, I feel like uh, art is a really uh, hard thing to do, for one thing, uh, in terms of, of really dedicating yourself to it. And, uh, and for me, it seems like half measures just weren't, aren't working. You know, half measures won't do. You have to actually go at it with everything. So. That's kind of what I, where I'm at right now. That's what I'm going to start. That's what I'm doing. The way it works is you get a map, a catalog, buy a ticket, and you get to see all 40 artists. All you need to know is on the website.